Hi, I'm Paul Brody. We're back. We took a week off Christmas time. Thank you for all the coffees. Mitch and I appreciate it very much. I know that some of you think that my shop is always so perfect and organized, but it's not always like that. And the upstairs has been a complete a disaster. So over this last week, I went upstairs and I did a bunch of organizing. I could hardly walk up there. There was so much stuff on the floor. I found some boxes that were marked Excelsius. I thought, wow, I haven't seen these boxes for a long time. So I brought them down and I have Excelsior parts on the table over here. And we're going to see if we can build a motorcycle out of these parts. Cross fingers. Thanks for coming along. I have here an, an Excelsior frame. And because there's a space in here, this is where the motor goes. This is known as a, a keystone frame. That's what they call them from back then. So I'm going to place this over the motor. I'm, I'm not doing it the same as the Excelsior where I start with the front wheel. It's easier in this situation to have the, the engine held up and then I place the frame over it. So let's try that. I need those two. Oh, there it goes. Wow, holes line up in everything. Everything is a standard size. I don't have any metric, no Whitworth, no BSF, BSC. It's just things like half inch, nine sixteenths, five eighths. Really basic. So the next step is the front of the engine mount. And that holds the magneto. That is a miter gear and it meshes with this miter gear. See there's a red felt pen and there's two red felt pens. That goes in between there. That's the timing for the ignition. Oh, there you go, just like that. Can you see there's a, a little bit of play? That's what you want, just a tiny little bit of play. On my race bike, on my Aramaki, we had some comments that said, how come you didn't use tapered bearings for your headset? Well, because I put them on the Excelsior, that's why. Okay, there we go. It had a, a little sticky spot there. See here? There's a piece of metal welded onto the frame. That's the steering stop. You can see how it comes and touches. Excelsior was owned by the Schwinn, uh, the Schwinn company, well, Ignaz Schwinn. And that was a bicycle decal as well, I think. I'm putting on the linkage now. There's all sorts of linkage because back in those days, they didn't have any, any cables like we have now. So linkage time. When I was making these bikes, making the linkage was very time consuming because it has to be really accurate and precise. Otherwise you get slop. You don't want slop. So see how that moves? Come down like that. Motorcycle racing, it started in the early 1900s. It was mostly ovals. There was dirt, road, which was asphalt, and board track. It's very hard to find information on the road tracks, whether they're flat or the banked. I don't know. A promoter emerged. His name was Jack. Prince, and he was an exceptional promoter. Over the next several years, he had board tracks all over the US. 
And these board tracks were copied from the bicycle world and they evolved. At first they had a half mile oval, but that proved to be pretty short for a motorcycle. And then they went to one mile and then later on a two mile. The bankings got steeper and steeper. At the ends they were at 60 degrees, you couldn't even walk up them. As the speeds increased, it got more and more dangerous. The handlebars, this works the carburetor or the throttle. And this is the spark advance on the magneto. So you've got your hands full, you might say. These board tracks were made out of pine boards. Large tracks used 34 box cars of pine boards and one box car of spikes or nails. These pine boards were untreated and the rain in the winters were very hard on them. That's a good fit. You knew I was going to say that. Okay, I made up this piece. It's not part of the excelsior but what it does i put it on top here you know like that if the bike goes anywhere in the van that's where the tie downs go because there's there's nowhere else really you can put the tie downs that aren't going to hurt the paint or do something like that and most handlebars go up so that's where the tie down goes but this one's these ones go down so that doesn't work so this is just to move the bike around, like going to shows or things like that. Oh, maybe I need to put those, no. Hmm. Maybe I'll put that linkage in next, because this might be in the way. So this is part of the linkage. I can tell this one goes on the left because this screw goes to the outside. That screw goes into there, so. After a couple seasons, these board tracks would get rough and uneven surfaces, adding to the danger. And engines would leak oil onto the boards. Oil and wood is not a good combination. One track had a hole in the boards and the local kids would poke their heads up and then duck down when the bikes raced by. At its peak, a board track of championships were 300 miles in length and often had 30,000 spectators. It was very exciting and the crowds loved it. The races were famous, often household names. There were names like Cannonball Baker, Leslie Red Parkhurst, he had red hair, Shrimp Burns, a Charles Fearless Balky, Joe Walters, and many others. Safety gear for the races was crude and almost non-existent, a leather helmet that had no hard shell. So these bikes were made in Chicago, and I call this a 1919. So what I want you to see is that when you turn the handlebars, this linkage all has, see how the linkage all moves? It's not like it just sits in one place. It has to rotate and also work as well. So it's kind of complex to get it all working nicely and smooth. Okay, this goes into the cob. I'm going to screw that in, but see this ball? It's, well, this is made out of brass, and this, this is a rod that has a ball on the end, so it's a connector. Not sure the actual name for that. And it needs a washer to space it. And then it winds in. And that's how the throttle works. See that? See how it's got some movement to it? And the last part to hook up is this. 
see there's a, a taper on the shaft and it's got little serrations there. This fits on like that. And then there's a washer and a nut. So you can see how the throttle is opening and closing now. See all this linkage working? Can you, can you see how much linkage there is just for the throttle? There's lots. Okay, so that's one part done. And this goes on to here. This is how you ad advance and retard the ignition as you're riding. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. And then you have to figure out how it all goes together. All of the factories raised because a win on Sunday meant sales on Monday. In the 60s, 70s and 80s, we had what was known as the big four. And those were the Japanese manufacturers, Honda, Yamaha, Suzuki and Kawasaki. Back in the early 1900s, it was the big three. There was Indian, they were the biggest, followed by Harley Davidson and Excelsior, the big three. There were all the smaller manufacturers as well, like Cyclone, Flying Merkel, Pope, Thor. Okay, so there, yeah, you can see how that works. That's advancing and retarding the ignition. When the racers went to the races, you have to understand that the road system was incomplete. It was stop and go. You could have asphalt for 50 miles and then it would just end and you'd have a dirt road with a lot of ruts. So in the early 1900s, there was no freeway system. If you wanted to go from Chicago to LA, for example, you got on the train. So. It was like the circus, which was traveling from town to town. Races and the bikes all went on the train. Okay, so now that linkage is hooked up, can, can you see how this all, all has to move? See how this is all moving as the bars are turning? So it's kind of a, a complex system, because as they move, everything has to work even as it moves. So you need to get all of, this, all of the friction out of there, the friction and the stiction. These are the wheels. It's a clincher tire. This rim curls around and the tires have a lip and the rubber goes into the lip. There's no bead. So all that holds it on is air, air pressure. So it's a dangerous tire because if you get a flat, there's nothing to hold the tire onto the rim. There's no bead and the tire comes off and then you crash. So you have to be aware of all that. So if you want to see inside here, Look, there's the ball bearing. So it's not exactly like it used to be, but much more, more, more practical, I would say. Engines in these board trackers were mostly 1000 cc V-twins. They had no clutch, no brakes, and no transmissions. Indian and Harley Davidson later had eight valve heads, and Excelsior was getting left behind. Excelsior had no race wins in 1919 at all. I have a special wrench, it's custom. I want to show you something. See that? The engine's being run, apparently. A young racer was hired by Excelsior in 1913, and his name was Bob Perry. He was short, but he was a good athlete and rider. Bob and Ignaz had both lost their fathers at an early age, so they had a bond. 
sort of like father and son. Ignaz had paid for Bob so that he could attend the University of Illinois, and he became a mechanical engineer, which was very useful at Excelsior. Here's the cap that goes on the top. Aluminum casting. Excelsior had no race wins in 1919. However, the R&D department had been busy. It started in 1918 after World War I ended and work had begun on a new, faster motor. It was inspired by, but not a copy, of the fast but fragile Cyclone Racer. See here, this is all part of the, the bottom bracket and the crank. That's the jack shaft. You can see the bearings there. And this is the eccentric. That's how you adjust the chains. So the first step is to put in the eccentric. Excelsior factory in Chicago was a huge brick building. At 200,000 square feet, it was the largest motorcycle factory in the world at that time. In the basement, hidden away in a corner, was the R&D department. It had wooden walls, the windows were high, and entry was restricted to a very small group of people. Head designer of the new motor was J.A. McNeil, assisted by Bob Perry and Carl Gowdy all engineers and racers. A lot of brainstorming was taking place over the new overhead cam motor. And is it left hand thread? No, this is, okay, so on this one that goes on the other side, it is left hand thread, this is a right hand thread. See, I got confused. So this is the jack shaft now, so. That goes on like that. Now we have the left hand thread. Because this spins that way. So you need a left hand thread. This is the crank. It's all, all machined out of, out of 4130. It was a casting to start with. And all the crank does is to hold up the rider's feet. It's not connected to any sprocket or anything, so it's just a place for the feet. On a bicycle nowadays, well, the old star was four. This is three. Things were different back then. Like a bicycle, left hand pedal gets a left hand thread. Right hand pedal gets a right hand thread. I paid a lot of money for these pedals. These are reproductions of old pedals. And they were like, like 15 years ago, I probably paid $300 US for this pair of pedals, but they're really nice. When you're working on these antique bikes, everything costs a lot of money. Nothing is cheap. Later in 1918, the motor ran for the first time on the test stand, but there were oiling issues or problems, so they had to be fixed. Oil was not going everywhere it needed to be. This really was a secret project, and that secrecy was well maintained. Okay. Pedals installed. See, there's not there's not a lot of room there, but there is room. There's just enough room to clear. I've been asked what the little sprocket does. On the street bikes, it was used to help start because it was hooked up to the cranks. On the race bike, it's a cover for the uh, it's a cover for the rear wheel bearing, so it's only on there because it stops the dirt going in. That's what I've been told. So there we go. Runs quite true. 
looks okay. Oh, it fits quite well. I need my other pair of pliers. On a master link, if you don't know, it's the rounded part that goes forward. You don't want these going forward. In October of 1918, the bike was taken out to a deserted country road and ridden for the very first time. Only three or four people were there. It was loud, it was noisy, and it went. Big smiles all around. It looked like a winner for sure. Okay, so there we go. We got a chain. You can see the, that's a jack shaft. It's turning. If I put on, on the small chain here, I can't roll the bike. So this one stays off so I can move the bike around. That's the logic. On this bike, we have two separate tanks. The right side is the gas tank. The left side is the oil tank. Around New Year's of 1919, there was an R&D meeting in that department, and it was decided to build four overhead cam racers for Team Excelsior. It was going to be a lot of work because a lot of parts were made by hand. Maintaining secrecy was important. A little bit of nickel plating here and there. I don't know if you're noticing that. There's, there's a bunch of parts that got nickel plated. Here's the fuel line. It's copper. It's nickel plated. When I open the throttle, you see this is a cam. Do you see that where my finger's pointing? That's the cam, and this is the roller. That's what lifts up the needle. There, that's full throttle. That's closing the needle, and then the cam hits it, opens it up. So anyway, that's how the Shebla carb works in a way. There's a lot of little things going on with the carburetor. Okay, so the fuel line is all hooked up now, so now we're gonna put on the oil tank. And the bikes were built in 1919, and the first race of 1920 was on the 4th of January. There was lots of excitement and anticipation. It was to be held at Ascot Racetrack in LA, which was a one mile asphalt oval. I don't know if it was flat or banked. McNeil, he didn't want Bob to race. He can't explain why. Schwinn didn't want Bob to race either. A premonition, perhaps? But Bob insisted on racing. He could not be talked out of it. See this line here? That's oil that goes from the oil tank into the motor and there's a valve there. So we'll get that guy hooked up now. And this line here is, is the return line to the tank. So this tube goes up into the tank. Can you see there's a hole there? You can, you, can, you can take off the filler cap when the engine's running and you can see oil as it comes back into the oil tank. So that's why this comes up because if, if it just went to the surface, the oil would leak back down because there's no valve. So you don't want the crankcase filling up with all the oil in the oil tank. That's why that's like that. It all fits pretty nicely, I think. I'm impressed. Okay. What we have here is a hand oil pump. It doesn't actually work. But on the race bikes back in 1919, when you're going down the straight at 100 miles an hour, it pumps oil right into the crankcase because the oiling systems back in those days were pretty marginal. It was total loss. You put oil into the crankcase and it splashed around and it leaked out. And that's how they worked. The 
We've got the high tension leads off the magneto. The Excelsior race team got on the train to LA. The 2nd of January was practice. There was a huge crowd out for this event, which not many people expected. Newspaper reporters everywhere. The new Excelsior race bike was getting a lot of attention. No one had expected a new racer from Excelsior. When I was working on the Excelsior project, I needed a seat. And you can buy a seat made by someone in the States and it's kind of flat, it was terrible. So I hunted around and I found a few people that said they could make me a seat and they did, but they were terrible. And then I was at a, a swap meet in Iowa, it was Davenport, and a guy walked by and he said, I can make a seat better than that. So that was Greg Hunt. I think he lives in Pennsylvania. And isn't that a beautiful seat? The guy does beautiful work. So that's Greg Hunt. So we need to mount it on something. So that's this. So that fits on like so. And then what holds it on, that goes like that as, as the support. And the bolt goes through the frame. You'll see how that works. We'll go put that on. Bob told everybody he wanted to be timed. He wanted to set a new lap record. In the excitement and commotion, the rear axle never got fully tightened. Eyewitness accounts said Bob was going faster than any other racer had ever gone, but then the rear wheel skidded and the rider and the bike went down. Bob's head hit a wooden pole and he never regained consciousness. Hockey tape. He was rushed to hospital and died five hours later. Ignaz Schwinn, when he heard the news, was devastated. The rumors say that he went to the race shop, smashed a couple of the new bikes and had them buried. No one knows for sure. What we do know is that the R&D department lost all of its funding and the race team was disbanded. A couple of the overhead cam races were seen at races in the next year or two, but no wins or finishes. Over the years, they were lost to time and history. And that should have been the end of the story, but it is not. I came along in 2005. I fell in love with this huge, handsome brute of a motor, and I decided that I would recreate the overhead cam Excelsior. For you watching this video, you are also a part of the Excelsior story now. I hope you have enjoyed our journey.